Chapter Four of Peter Pan by J. M. Barry. The Flight. Second to the right and straight on till morning. That Peter had told Wendy was the way to the Neverland. But even birds, carrying maps and consulting them at windy corners, could not have sighted it with these instructions. Peter, you see, just said anything that came into his head. At first his companions trusted him implicitly, and so great were the delights of flying that they wasted time circling round church spires or any other tall object on the way that took their fancy. John and Michael raced, Michael getting a start. They recalled with contempt that not so long ago they had thought themselves fine fellows for being able to fly round a room. Not long ago. But how long ago? They were flying over the sea before the thought began to disturb Wendy seriously. John thought it was their second sea and their third night. Sometimes it was dark and sometimes light, and now they were very cold and again too warm. Did they really feel hungry at times, or were they merely pretending, because Peter had such a jolly new way of feeding them? His way was to pursue birds who had food in their mouths, suitable for humans, and snatch it from them. Then the birds would follow and snatch it back, and they would all go chasing each other gaily for miles, parting at last with mutual expressions of goodwill. But Wendy noticed with gentle concern that Peter did not seem to know that this was rather an odd way of getting your bread and butter, nor even that there are other ways. Certainly they did not pretend to be sleepy. They were sleepy. And that was a danger. For the moment they popped off, down they fell. The awful thing was that Peter thought this funny. There he goes again, he would cry gleefully, as Michael suddenly dropped like a stone. Save him, save him, cried Wendy, looking with horror at the cruel sea far below. Eventually Peter would dive through the air and catch Michael just before he could strike the sea. And it was lovely the way he did it. But he always waited till the last moment and you felt it was his cleverness that interested him and not the saving of human life. Also, he was fond of variety, and the sport that engrossed him for one moment would suddenly cease to engage him. So there was always the possibility that the next time you fell he would let you go. He could sleep in the air without falling by merely lying on his back and floating. But this was, partly at least, because he was so light, that if you got behind him and blew, he went faster. "'Do be more polite to him,' Wendy whispered to John when they were playing. "'Follow my leader. Then tell him to stop showing off,' said John. When playing follow my leader, Peter would fly close to the water and touch each shark's tail in passing, just as in the street you may run your finger along an iron railing. They could not follow him in this with much success, so perhaps it was rather like showing off, especially as he kept looking behind to see how many tails they missed. "'You must be nice to him,' Wendy impressed on her brothers. "'What would we do if he were to leave us?' "'We could go back,' Michael said. "'How could we ever find our way back without him?' "'Well, then we could go on,' said John. That is the awful thing, John. We should have to go on, for we don't know how to stop. That was true. Peter had forgotten to show them how to stop. John said that if worst came to the worst, all they had to do was to go straight on, for the world was round, and so in time they must come back to their own window. And who is to get food for us, John? I nipped a bit out of that eagle's mouth pretty neatly, Wendy." After the twentieth try, Wendy reminded him, and even though we became good at picking up food, see how we bump against clouds and things if he is not near to give us a hand? Indeed, they were constantly bumping. They could now fly strongly, though they still kicked far too much. 
but if they saw a cloud in front of them, the more they tried to avoid it the more certainly did they bump into it. If Nana had been with them she would have had a bandage round Michael's forehead by this time. Peter was not with them for the moment, and they felt rather lonely up there by themselves. He could go so much faster than they that he would suddenly shoot out of sight to have some adventure in which they had no share. He would come down laughing over something fearfully funny he had been saying to a star, but he had already forgotten what it was, or he would come up with mermaid scales still sticking to him and yet not be able to say for certain what had been happening. It was really rather irritating to children who had never seen a mermaid. And if he forgets them so quickly, Wendy argued, how can we expect that he will go on remembering us? Indeed, sometimes when he returned he did not remember them, at least not well. Wendy was sure of it. She saw recognition come into his eyes as he was about to pass them the time of day and go on. Once she even had to call him by name. "'I'm Wendy,' she said agitatedly. He was very sorry. "'I say, Wendy,' he whispered to her, "'always, if you see me forgetting you, just keep on saying, "'I'm Wendy, and then I'll remember.' Of course this was rather unsatisfactory. However, to make amends, he showed them how to lie out flat on a strong wind that was going their way, and this was such a pleasant change that they tried it several times and found that they could sleep thus with security. Indeed, they would have slept longer, but Peter tired quickly of sleeping, and soon he would cry in his captain voice, "'We get off here!' So with occasional tiffs, but on the whole rollicking, they drew near the Neverland for after many moons they did reach it, and, what is more, they had been going pretty straight all the time, not perhaps so much owing to the guidance of Peter or Tink as because the island was looking for them. It is only thus that any one might sight those magic shores. "'There it is,' said Peter calmly. "'Where? Where?' "'Where all the arrows are pointing.' Indeed, a million golden arrows were pointing it out to the children all directed by their friend the sun, who wanted them to be sure of their way before leaving them for the night. Wendy and John and Michael stood on tiptoe in the air to get their first sight of the island. Strange to say, they all recognized it at once, and until fear fell upon them they hailed it, not as something long dreamt of and seen at last, but as a familiar friend to whom they were returning home for the holidays. John, there's the lagoon. Wendy, look at the turtles burying their eggs in the sand. I say, John, I see your flamingo with the broken leg. Look, Michael, there's your cave. John, what's that in the brushwood? It's a wolf with her whelps. Wendy, I do believe that's your little whelp. There's my boat, John, with her side stove in. No, it isn't. Why, we burned your boat. That's her at any rate. I say, John, I see the smoke of the redskin camp. Where? Show me, and I'll tell you by the way smoke curls whether they are on the warpath. There, just across the mysterious river. I see it now. Yes, they are on the warpath right enough. Peter was a little annoyed with them for knowing so much, but if he wanted to lord it over them his triumph was at hand. For have I not told you that anon fear fell upon them? It came as the arrows went, leaving the island in gloom. In the old days at home the Neverland had always begun to look a little dark and threatening by bedtime. Then unexplored patches arose in it and spread, black shadows moved about in them, the roar of the beasts of prey was quite different now, and above all you lost the certainty that you would win. You were quite glad that the night lights were on. You even liked Nana to say that this was just the mantelpiece over here, and that the Neverland was all make-believe. Of course, the Neverland had been make-believe in those days. But it was real now, and there were no night lights, and it was getting darker every moment. And where was Nana? 
They had been flying apart, but they huddled close to Peter now. His careless manner had gone at last, his eyes were sparkling, and a tingle went through them every time they touched his body. They were now over the fearsome island, flying so low that sometimes a tree grazed their feet. Nothing horrid was visible in the air, yet their progress had become slow and labored exactly as if they were pushing their way through hostile forces. Sometimes they hung in the air until Peter had beaten on it with his fists. "'They don't want us to land,' he explained. "'Who are they?' Wendy whispered, shuddering. But he could not or would not say. Tinkerbell had been asleep on his shoulder, but now he wakened her and sent her on in front. Sometimes he poised himself in the air, listening intently, with his hand to his ear. And again he would stare down with eyes so bright that they seemed to bore two holes to earth. Having done these things, he went on again. His courage was almost appalling. "'Would you like an adventure now?' he said casually to John. "'Or would you like to have your tea first? Wendy said, "'Tea first, quickly.' And Michael pressed her hand in gratitude, but the braver John hesitated. "'What kind of adventure?' he asked cautiously. "'There's a pirate asleep in the pampas just beneath us,' Peter told him. "'If you like, we'll go down and kill him.' "'I don't see him,' John said after a long pause. "'I do.' "'Suppose,' John said a little huskily, "'he were to wake up.' Peter spoke indignantly. "'You don't think I would kill him while he was sleeping?' I would wake him first, and then kill him. That's the way I always do." "'I say, do you kill many?' "'Tons!' John said, "'How ripping!' but decided to have tea first. He asked if there were many pirates on the island just now, and Peter said he had never known so many. "'Who is captain now?' "'Hook,' answered Peter and his face became very stern as he said that hated word. "'James Hook?' "'Aye.' Then indeed Michael began to cry, and even John could speak in gulps only, for they knew Hook's reputation. "'He was Blackbeard's boatswain,' John whispered huskily. "'He is the worst of them all. He is the only man of whom Barbecue was afraid.' "'That's him,' said Peter. What is he like? Is he big?" He is not so big as he was. How do you mean? I cut off a bit of him. You? Yes, me, said Peter sharply. I wasn't meaning to be disrespectful. Oh, all right. But I say, what bit? His right hand. Then he can't fight now? Oh, can't he just? Left-hander? He has an iron hook instead of a right hand, and he claws with it. Claws! I say, John, said Peter. Yes, say aye, aye, sir. Uh, aye, aye, sir. There is one thing, Peter continued, that every boy who serves under me has to promise, and so must you. John paled. It is this. If we meet Hook in open fight, you must leave him to me. I promise. John said loyally. For the moment they were feeling less eerie, because Tink was flying with them, and in her light they could distinguish each other. Unfortunately she could not fly so slowly as they, and so she had to go round and round them in a circle in which they moved, as in a halo. Wendy quite liked it, until Peter pointed out the drawbacks. "'She tells me,' he said that the pirates sighted us before the darkness came, and got Long Tom out. The big gun? Yes. And of course they must see her light, and if they guess we are near it, they are sure to let fly. Wendy! John! Michael! Tell her to go away at once, Peter! the three cried simultaneously, but he refused. She thinks we have lost the way, he replied stiffly, and she is rather frightened. You don't think I would send her away all by herself when she is frightened? For a moment the circle of light was broken, and something gave Peter a loving little pinch. Then tell her, Wendy begged, to put out her light. 
She can't put it out. That is about the only thing fairies can't do. It just goes out of itself when she falls asleep, same as the stars. Then tell her to sleep at once, John almost ordered. She can't sleep except when she's sleepy. It is the only other thing fairies can't do. Seems to me, growled John, these are the only two things worth doing. Here he got a pinch, but not a loving one. If only one of us had a pocket, Peter said, we could carry her in it. However, they had set off in such a hurry that there was not a pocket between the four of them. He had a happy idea. John's hat. Tink agreed to travel by hat if it was carried in the hand. John carried it, though she had hoped to be carried by Peter. Presently Wendy took the hat, because John said it struck against his knees as he flew, and this, as we shall see, led to mischief, for Tinkerbell hated to be under an obligation to Wendy. In the black topper the light was completely hidden, and they flew on in silence. It was the stillest silence they had ever known, broken once by a distant lapping, which Peter explained was the wild beast drinking at the ford, and again by a rasping sound that might have been the branches of trees rubbing together, but he said it was the redskins sharpening their knives. Even these noises ceased. To Michael the loneliness was dreadful. If only something would make a sound, he cried. As if in answer to his request, the air was rent by the most tremendous crash he had ever heard. The pirates had fired Long Tom at them. The roar of it echoed through the mountains, and the echoes seemed to cry savagely, Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Thus sharply did the terrified three learn the difference between an island of make-believe and the same island come true. When at last the heavens were steady again, John and Michael found themselves alone in the darkness. John was treading the air mechanically, and Michael, without knowing how to float, was floating. Are, are you shot? John whispered tremulously. I haven't tried yet, Michael whispered back. We know now that no one had been hit. Peter, however, had been carried by the wind of the shot far out to sea, while Wendy was blown upwards with no companion but Tinkerbell. It would have been well for Wendy if at that moment she had dropped the hat. I don't know whether the idea came suddenly to Tink, or whether she had planned it on the way, but she at once popped out of the hat and began to lure Wendy to her destruction. Tink was not all bad, or rather she was all bad just now, but on the other hand sometimes she was all good. Fairies have to be one thing or the other, because being so small, they unfortunately have room for one feeling only at a time. They are, however, allowed to change, only it must be a complete change. At present she was full of jealousy of Wendy. What she said in her lovely tinkle Wendy could not, of course, understand, and I believe some of it was bad words. But it sounded kind, and she flew back and forward plainly meaning, follow me, and all will be well. What else could poor Wendy do? She called to Peter and John and Michael, and got only mocking echoes in reply. She did not yet know that Tink hated her with the fierce hatred of a very woman. And so, bewildered, and now staggering in her flight, she followed Tink to her doom. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 The Island Come True Feeling that Peter was on his way back, the Neverland had again woke into life. We ought to use the pluperfect and say wakened, but woke is better and was always used by Peter. In his absence things are usually quiet on the island. The fairies take an hour longer in the morning, the beasts attend to their young, the redskins feed heavily for six days and nights and, when pirates and lost boys meet, they merely bite their thumbs at each other. But with the coming of Peter, who hates lethargy, they are under way again. If you put your ear to the ground now, 
you would hear the whole island seething with life. On this evening the chief forces of the island were disposed as follows. The lost boys were out looking for Peter, the pirates were out looking for the lost boys, the redskins were out looking for the pirates, and the beasts were out looking for the redskins. They were going round and round the island, but they did not meet, because all were going at the same rate. All wanted blood, except the boys, who liked it as a rule, but tonight were out to greet their captain. The boys on the island vary, of course, in numbers, according as they get killed and so on, and when they seem to be growing up, which is against the rules, Peter thins them out, but at this time there were six of them, counting the twins as two. Let us pretend to lie here among the sugar-cane and watch them as they steal by in single file, each with his hand on his dagger. They are forbidden by Peter to look in the least like him, and they wear the skins of the bears slain by themselves, in which they are so round and furry that when they fall they roll. They have therefore become very sure-footed. The first to pass is Toodles. Not the least brave, but the most unfortunate of all that gallant band. He had been in fewer adventures than any of them, because the big things constantly happened just when he had stepped round the corner. All would be quiet. He would take the opportunity of going off to gather a few sticks for firewood, and then, when he returned, the others would be sweeping up the blood. This ill luck had given a gentle melancholy to his countenance, but instead of souring his nature had sweetened it, so that he was quite the humblest of the boys. Poor kind Tootles, there is danger in the air for you to-night. Take care, lest an adventure is now offered you which, if accepted, will plunge you in deepest woe. Tootles, the fairy tink, who is bent on mischief this night, is looking for a tool, and she thinks you are the most easily tricked of the boys. Where Tinker Bell? Would that he could hear us, but we are not really on the island, and he passes by biting his knuckles. Next comes Nibs, the gay and debonair, followed by Slightly, who cuts whistle out of the trees and dances ecstatically to his own tunes. Slightly is the most conceited of the boys. He thinks he remembers the days before he was lost, with their manners and customs, and this has given his nose an offensive tilt. Curly is fourth. He is a pickle, and so often has he had to deliver up his person when Peter said sternly, Stand forth the one who did this, that now, at the command, he stands forth automatically whether he has done it or not. Last come the twins who cannot be described because we should be sure to be describing the wrong one. Peter never quite knew what twins were, and his band were not allowed to know anything he did not know, so these two were always vague about themselves, and did their best to give satisfaction by keeping close together in an apologetic sort of way. The boys vanish in the gloom, and after a pause, but not a long pause, for things go briskly on the island, Come the pirates on their track. We hear them before they are seen, and it is always the same dreadful song. Avast belay, yo ho, heave to, a pirating we go, and if we're parted by a shot, we're sure to meet below. A more villainous looking lot never hung in a row on execution dock. Here, a little in advance, ever and again with his head to the ground listening, his great arms bare, pieces of eight in his ears as ornaments, is the handsomest Italian Cecco, who cut his name in letters of blood on the back of the governor of the prison at Gao. That gigantic black behind him has had many names since he dropped the one with which dusky mothers still terrified their children on the banks of the Guajamo. Here is Bill Jukes, every inch of him tattooed, the same Bill Jukes who got six dozen on the walrus from Flint before he would drop the bag of Moidores and Cookson, said to be Black Murphy's brother, but this was never proved, 
and gentleman Starkey, once an usher in a public school, and still dainty in his ways of killing, and Skylights, Morgan's Skylights, and the Iris Boatswain Smee, an oddly genial man, who stabbed, so to speak, without offence, and was the only nonconformist in Hook's crew, and Noodler, whose hands were fixed on backwards, and Robert Mullins and Alf Mason and many other ruffian long known and feared on the Spanish main. In the midst of them, the blackest and largest in that dark setting, reclined James Hook, or, as he wrote himself, Jay's Hook, of whom it is said he was the only man that the sea cook feared. He lay at his ease in a rough chariot, drawn and propelled by his men, and instead of a right hand he had the iron hook, with which ever and anon he encouraged them to increase their pace. As dogs this terrible man treated and addressed them, and as dogs they obeyed him. In person he was cadaverous and black of eyes, and his hair was dressed in long curls, which at a little distance looked like black candles, and gave a singularly threatening expression to his handsome countenance. His eyes were of the blue of the forget-me-not, and of a profound melancholy, save when he was plunging his hook into you, at which time two red spots appeared in them and lit them up horribly. In manner something of the grand seigneur still clung to him, so that he even ripped you up with an air, and I have been told that he was a raconteur of repute. He was never more sinister than when he was most polite, which is probably the truest test of breeding, and the elegance of his diction, even when he was swearing, no less than the distinction of his demeanour, showed him one of a different caste from his crew. A man of indomitable courage, it was said that the only thing he shied at was the sight of his own blood, which was thick and of an unusual colour. In dress he sometimes aped the attire associated with the name of Charles the Second, having heard it said in some earlier period of his career that he bore a strange resemblance to the ill-fated Stuarts, and in his mouth he had a holder of his own contrivance which enabled him to smoke two cigars at once. But undoubtedly the grimmest part of him was his iron claw. Let us now kill a pirate to show Hook's method. Skylights will do. As they pass, Skylights lurches clumsily against him, ruffling his lace collar. The Hook shoots forth. There is a tearing sound, and one screech. Then the body is kicked aside, and the pirates pass on. He has not even taken the cigars from his mouth. Such is the terrible man against whom Peter Pan is pitted. Which will win? On the trail of the pirates, stealing noiselessly down the warpath, which is not visible to inexperienced eyes, come the redskins, every one of them with his eyes peeled. They carry tomahawks and knives and their naked bodies gleam with paint and oil. Strung around them are scalps, of boys as well as of pirates. For these are the Piccaninny tribe, and not to be confused with the softer-hearted Delawares or the Hurons. In the van, on all fours, is great big little Panther, a brave of so many scalps that in his present position they somewhat impede his progress. Bringing up the rear, the place of greatest danger, comes Tiger Lily, proudly erect, a princess in her own right. She is the most beautiful of dusky Dianas, and the belle of the Piccaninnies, coquettish, cold, and amorous by turns. There is not a brave who would not have the wayward thing to wife, but she staves off the altar with a hatchet. Observe how they pass over fallen twigs without making the slightest noise. The only sound to be heard is their somewhat heavy breathing. The fact is that they are all a little fat just now, after the heavy gorging, but in no time they will work this off. For the moment, however, it constitutes their chief danger. The redskins disappear as they have come like shadows, and soon their place is taken by the beasts. 
a great and motley procession. Lions, tigers, bears, and the innumerable smaller savage things that flee from them. For every kind of beast, and more particularly all the man-eaters, live cheek by jowl on the favored island. Their tongues are hanging out. They are hungry to-night. When they have passed, comes the last figure of all, a gigantic crocodile. We shall see for whom she is looking presently. The crocodile passes, but soon the boys appear again, for the procession must continue indefinitely until one of the party stops or changes its pace. Then quickly they will all be on top of each other. All are keeping a sharp lookout in front, but none suspects that the danger may be creeping up from behind. This shows how real the island was. The first to fall out of the moving circle was the boys. They flung themselves downward on the sward close to their underground home. "'I do wish Peter would come back,' every one of them said nervously, though in height and still more in breath they were all larger than their captain. "'I am the only one who is not afraid of the pirates,' slightly said, in the tone that prevented his being a general favorite. But perhaps some distant sound disturbed him, for he added hastily, "'But I wish he would come back and tell us whether he has heard anything more about Cinderella.' They talked of Cinderella, and Tootles was confident that his mother must have been very like her. It was only in Peter's absence that they could speak of mothers the subject being forbidden by him is silly. "'All I remember about my mother,' Nibs told him, "'is that she often said to my father, "'Oh, how I wish I had a checkbook of my own!' "'I don't know what a checkbook is, but I should just love to give my mother one.' While they talked they heard a distant sound. You or I, not being wild things of the wood, would have heard nothing. But they heard it and it was the grim song, Yo-ho, yo-ho, the pirate life, the flag of skull and bones, a merry hour, a hemp and rope, and hey for Davy Jones. At once the lost boys. But where are they? They are no longer there. Rabbits could not have disappeared more quickly. I will tell you where they are, with the exception of Nibs, who has darted away to reconnoiter. They are already in their home under the ground, a very delightful residence of which we shall see a good deal presently. But how have they reached it? For there is no entrance to be seen, not so much as a large stone, which, if rolled away, would disclose a mouth of a cave. Look closely, however, and you may note that there are here seven large trees, each with a hole in its hollow trunk as large as a boy. These are the seven entrances to the home underground, for which Hook has been searching in vain these many moons. Will he find it tonight? As the pirates advanced, the quick eye of Starkey sighted Nibs disappearing through the wood, and at once his pistol flashed out. But an iron claw gripped his shoulder. "'Captain, let go!' he cried, writhing. "'Now for the first time we hear the voice of Hook.' It is a black voice. "'Put back that pistol first, it said threateningly. "'It was one of those boys you hate. I could have shot him dead.' "'Aye, and the sound would have brought Tiger Lily's red skins upon us. Do you want to lose your scalp?' "'Shall I go after him, Captain?' asked pathetic Smee. A "'And tickle him with Johnny Corkscrew?' Smee had pleasant names for everything, and his cutlass was Johnny Corkscrew because he wiggled it in the wound. One could mention many lovable traits in Smee. For instance, after killing, it was his spectacles he wiped instead of his weapon. "'Johnny's a silent fellow,' he reminded Hook. "'Not now, Smee,' Hook said darkly. He is only one, and I want to mischief all the seven. Scatter and look for them." The pirates disappeared among the trees, and in a moment their captain and Smee were alone. Hook heaved a heavy sigh, 
and I know not why it was, perhaps it was because of the soft beauty of the evening, but there came over him a desire to confide to his faithful boatswain the story of his life. He spoke long and earnestly, but what it was all about Smee, who was rather stupid, did not know in the least. Anon he caught the word Peter. Most of all, Hook was saying passionately, I want their Captain Peter Pan. Twas he cut off my arm. He brandished the hook threateningly. I've waited long to shake his hand with this. Oh, I'll tear him. And yet, said Smee, I have often heard you say that hook was worth a score of hands for combing the hair and other homely uses. Aye, the captain answered. If I was a mother I would pray to have my children born with this instead of that." And he cast a look of pride upon his iron hand, and one of scorn upon the other. Then again he frowned. "'Peter flung my arm,' he said, wincing, "'to a crocodile that happened to be passing by.' "'I have often,' said Smee, "'noticed your strange dread of crocodiles.' Not of crocodiles, Hook corrected him, but of that one crocodile. He lowered his voice. It liked my arm so much, Smee, that it has followed me ever since from sea to sea and from land to land, licking its lips for the rest of me. In a way, said Smee, it's sort of a compliment. I want no such compliments. Hook barked petulantly. I want Peter Pan, who first gave the brute its taste for me. He sat down on a large mushroom, and now there was a quiver in his voice. Sus me, he said huskily. That crocodile would have had me before this, but by a lucky chance it swallowed a clock which goes tick, tick inside it. And so before it can reach me I hear the tick and bolt." He laughed, but in a hollow way. "'Some day,' said Smee, "'the clock will run down, and then he'll get you.' Hook wetted his dry lips. "'Aye,' he said, "'that's the fear that haunts me.' Since sitting down he had felt curiously warm. Smee, he said, this seat is hot. He jumped up. Odds, bods, hammer and tongs, I'm burning. They examined the mushroom, which was of a real size and solidity unknown on the mainland. They tried to pull it up, and it came away at once in their hands, for it had no root. Stranger still, smoke began at once to ascend. The pirates looked at each other. A chimney, they both exclaimed. They had indeed discovered the chimney of the home underground. It was the custom of the boys to stop it with a mushroom when enemies were in the neighborhood. Not only smoke came out of it, there were also children's voices, for so safe did the boys feel in their hiding place that they were gaily chattering. The pirates listened grimly, and then replaced the mushroom. They looked around them and noted the holes in the seven trees. "'Did you hear them say Peter Pan's from home?' Smee whispered, fidgeting with Johnny Corkscrew. Hook nodded. He stood for a long time lost in thought, and at last a curdling smile lit up his swarthy face. Smee had been waiting for it. "'Unrip your plan, Captain!' he cried eagerly. "'To return to the ship,' Hook replied slowly through his teeth, "'and cook a large, rich cake of a jolly thickness, with green sugar on it. There can be but one room below, for there is but one chimney. The silly moles had not the sense to see that they did not need a door apiece. That shows they have no mother.' We'll leave the cake on the shore of the mermaid's lagoon. <laughs> These boys are always swimming about there, playing with the mermaids. They will find the cake 
and they will gobble it up, because, having no mother, they don't know how dangerous it is to eat rich, damp cake. He burst into laughter, not hollow laughter now, but honest laughter. Ha, ha, ha! They will die! Smee had listened with growing admiration. It's the wickedest, prettiest policy I ever heard of, he cried, and in their exultation they danced and sang. A vast belay when I appear, by fear they're overtook. Knots left upon your bones when you have taken claws with hook. They began the verse, but they never finished it, for another sound broke in and stilled them. There was at first such a tiny sound that a leaf might have fallen on it and smothered it, but as it came nearer it was more distinct. Tick, 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 tick. Hook stood shuddering one foot in the air. The crocodile, he gasped and bounded away, followed by his bosun. It was indeed the crocodile. It had passed the redskins, who were now on the trail of the other pirates. It oozed on after Hook. Once more the boys emerged into the open, but the dangers of the night were not yet over, for presently Nibs rushed breathlessly into their midst, pursued by a pack of wolves. The tongues of the pursuers were hanging out. The baying of them was horrible. "'Save me! Save me!' cried Nibs, falling on the ground. But what can we do? What can we do? It was a high compliment to Peter that at that dire moment their thoughts turned to him. What would Peter do? they cried simultaneously. Almost in the same breath they cried, Peter would look at them through his legs. And then, let us do what Peter would do. It is quite the most successful way of defying wolves, and as one boy they bent and looked through their legs. The next moment is the long one, but victory came quickly, for as the boys advanced upon them in the terrible attitude the wolves dropped their tails and fled. Now Nibs rose from the ground, and the others thought that his staring eyes still saw the wolves. But it was not wolves he saw. "'I have seen a wonderfuller thing,' he cried, as they gathered round him eagerly. "'A great white bird! It is flying this way!' "'What kind of a bird do you think?' "'I don't know,' Nib said, awestruck. "'But it looks so weary, and as it flies it moans, "'Poor Wendy!' "'Poor Wendy!' "'I remember,' said slightly instantly, there are birds called Wendy's. See, it comes, cried Curly, pointing to Wendy in the heavens. Wendy was now almost overhead, and they could hear her plaintive cry. But more distinct came the shrill voice of Tinkerbell. The jealous fairy had now cast off all disguise of friendship, and was darting at her victim from every direction pinching savagely each time she touched. "'Hello, Tink!' cried the wondering boys. Tink's reply rang out. "'Peter wants you to shoot the Wendy.' It was not in their nature to question when Peter ordered. "'Let us do what Peter wishes,' cried the simple boys. "'Quick, bows and arrows!' All but Tootles popped down their trees. He had a bow and arrow with him, and Tink noted it and rubbed her little hands. "'Quick, Tootles, quick!' she screamed. "'Peter will be so pleased!' Tootles excitedly fitted the arrow to his bow. "'Out of the way, Tink!' he shouted. And then he fired, and Wendy fluttered to the ground with an arrow in her breast. End of Chapter 5 Chapter 6 the Little House Foolish Tootles was standing like a conqueror over Wendy's body when the other boys sprang armed from their trees. "'You are too late,' he cried proudly. "'I have shot the Wendy. 
Peter will be so pleased with me. Overhead Tinkerbell shouted, Silly ass, and darted into hiding. The others did not hear her. They had crowded round Wendy, and as they looked, a terrible silence fell upon the wood. If Wendy's heart had been beating, they would all have heard it. Slightly was the first to speak. "'This is no bird,' he said in a scared voice. "'I think this must be a lady.' "'A lady?' said Tootles, and fell a-trembling. "'And we have killed her,' Nib said hoarsely. They all whipped off their caps. "'Now I see.' Curly said, Peter was bringing her to us. He threw himself sorrowfully on the ground. A lady to take care of us at last, said one of the twins, and you have killed her. They were sorry for him, but sorrier for themselves, and when he took a step nearer them they turned from him. Tootle's face was very white. But there was a dignity about him now that had never been there before. "'I did it,' he said, reflecting. "'When ladies used to come to me in dreams, I said, "'Pretty mother, pretty mother. "'But when at last she really came, I shot her.' He moved slowly away. "'Don't go,' they called in pity. "'I must,' he answered, shaking. I'm so afraid of Peter." It was at this tragic moment that they heard a sound which made the heart of every one of them rise to his mouth. They heard Peter crow. "'Peter!' they cried, for it was always thus that he signaled his return. "'Hide her!' they whispered, and gathered hastily around Wendy. But Tootles stood aloof. Again that ringing crow, and Peter dropped in front of them. "'Greetings, boys!' he cried, and mechanically they saluted, and then again was silence. He frowned. "'I am back,' he said hotly. "'Why do you not cheer?' They opened their mouths, but the cheers would not come. He overlooked it in his haste to tell the glorious tidings. "'Great news, boys!' he cried. I have brought at last a mother for you all." Still no sound, except a little thud from Tootles as he dropped on his knees. "'Have you not seen her?' asked Peter, becoming troubled. "'She flew this way.' "'Ah, me!' one voice said, and another said, "'Oh, mournful day!' Tootles rose. "'Peter,' he said quietly, I will show her to you." And when the others would still have hidden her, he said, "'Back, twins, let Peter see.' So they all stood back and let him see, and after he had looked for a little while he did not know what to do next. "'She is dead,' he said uncomfortably. "'Perhaps she is frightened at being dead?' He thought of hopping off in a comic sort of way till he was out of sight of her and then never going near the spot any more. They would all have been glad to follow if he had done this. But there was the arrow. He took it from her heart and faced his band. "'Whose arrow?' he demanded sternly. "'Mine, Peter,' said Tootles on his knees. "'Oh, dastard hand!' Peter said, and he raised the arrow to use it as a dagger. Tootles did not flinch. He bared his breast. "'Strike, Peter,' he said firmly. "'Strike true.' Twice did Peter raise the arrow, and twice did his hand fall. "'I cannot strike,' he said with awe. "'There is something stays my hand.' All looked at him in wonder, save Nibs, who fortunately looked at Wendy. "'It is she,' he cried. The Wendy lady, see, her arm?" Wonderful to relate, Wendy had raised her arm. Nibs bent over her and listened reverently. "'I think she said, poor Tootles,' he whispered. "'She lives,' Peter said briefly. Slightly cried instantly, "'The Wendy lady lives!' 
Then Peter knelt beside her and found his button. You remember she had put it on a chain that she wore round her neck. See, he said, the arrow struck against this. It is the kiss I gave her. It has saved her life. I remember kisses, slightly interposed quickly. Let me see it. Aye, that's a kiss. Peter did not hear him. He was begging Wendy to get better quickly so that he could show her the mermaids. Of course she could not answer yet, being still in a frightful faint. But from overhead came a wailing note. "'Listen to Tink,' said Curly. "'She is crying because the Wendy lives.' Then they had to tell Peter of Tink's crime, and almost never had they seen him look so stern. "'Listen, Tinker Bell,' he cried. I am your friend no more. Be gone from me for ever." She flew on to his shoulder and pleaded, but he brushed her off. Not until Wendy again raised her arm did he relent sufficiently to say, "'Well, not for ever, but for a whole week.'" Do you think Tinkerbell was grateful to Wendy for raising her arm? Oh, dear, no! Never wanted to pinch her so much. Fairies indeed are strange, and Peter, who understands them best, often cuffed them. But what to do with Wendy in her present delicate state of health? Let us carry her down into the house, Curly suggested. Aye, said slightly, that is what one does with ladies. No, no, Peter said, you must not touch her. It would not be sufficiently respectful. That, said slightly, is what I was thinking. But if she lies there, Tootles said, she will die. Aye, she will die, slightly admitted, but there is no way out. Yes, there is, cried Peter. Let us build a little house round her. They were all delighted. Quick, he ordered them, bring me each of you the best of what we have. Got our house. Be sharp. In a moment they were as busy as tailors the night before a wedding. They scurried this way and that, down for bedding, up for firewood, and while they were at it, who should appear but John and Michael? As they dragged along the ground they fell asleep standing, stopped, woke up, moved another step, and slept again. "'John, John,' Michael would cry, "'wake up! Where is Nana, John, and Mother?' And then John would rub his eyes and mutter, it is true, we did fly. You may be sure they were very relieved to find Peter. Hello, Peter, they said. Hello, replied Peter amiably, though he had quite forgotten about them. He was very busy at the moment measuring Wendy with his feet to see how large a house she would need. Of course he meant to leave room for chairs and a table. John and Michael watched him. Is Wendy asleep? they asked. Yes. John, Michael proposed, let us wake her and get her to make supper for us. But as he said it, some of the other boys rushed on carrying branches for the building of the house. Look at them, he cried. Curly, said Peter in his most captainy voice, see that these boys help in the building of the house. Aye, aye, sir. Build a house? exclaimed John. For the Wendy, said Curly. For Wendy? John said aghast. Why, she is only a girl. That, explained Curly, is why we are her servants. You? Wendy's servants? Yes, said Peter, and you also. Away with them. The astounded brothers were dragged away to hack and hew and carry. Chairs and a fender first, Peter ordered. Then we shall build a house round them. Aye, said slightly, that is how a house is built. It all comes back to me. Peter thought of everything. Slightly, he cried, fetch a doctor. Aye, aye, said slightly at once, and disappeared, scratching his head. But he knew Peter must be obeyed, and he returned in a moment, wearing John's hat and looking solemn. Please, sir, said Peter, going to him. Are you a doctor? The difference between him and the other boys at such a time was that they knew it was make-believe, 
while to him make-believe and true were exactly the same thing. This sometimes troubled them, as when they had to make believe that they had had their dinners. If they broke down in their make-believe, he rapped them on the knuckles. Yes, my little man, slightly anxiously replied, who had chapped knuckles. Please, sir, Peter explained, a lady lies very ill. She was lying at their feet, but slightly had the sense not to see her. Tot, tot, tot he said. Where does she lie? In yonder glade. I will put a glass thing in her mouth, said Slightly, and he made believe to do it, whilst Peter waited. It was an anxious moment when the glass thing was withdrawn. How is she? inquired Peter. Tut tut tut, said Slightly. This has cured her. I am glad, Peter cried. I will call again in the evening," slightly said. Give her beef tea out of a cup with a spout to it. But after he had returned the hat to John he blew big breaths, which was his habit on escaping from a difficulty. In the meantime the wood had been alive with the sound of axes. Almost everything needed for a cozy dwelling already lay at Wendy's feet. "'If only we knew,' said one, the kind of house she likes best. Peter, shouted another, she is moving in her sleep. Her mouth opens, cried a third, looking respectfully into it. Oh, lovely! Perhaps she is going to sing in her sleep, said Peter. Wendy, sing the kind of house you would like to have. Immediately, without opening her eyes, Wendy began to sing. I wish I had a pretty house, the littlest ever seen with funny little red walls and a roof of mossy green. They gurgle with joy at this, for by the greatest good luck the branches they had brought were sticky with red sap, and all the ground was carpeted with moss. As they rattled up the little house they broke into song themselves. We built the little walls and roof, and made a lovely door. So tell us, Mother Wendy, what are you wanting more?" To this she answered greedily, "'Oh, really, next I think I'll have gay windows all about, with roses peeping in, you know, and babies peeping out.' With a blow of their fists they made windows, and large yellow leaves were the blinds. But roses! Roses, cried Peter sternly. Quickly they made believe to grow the loveliest roses up the walls. Babies? To prevent Peter ordering babies, they hurried into song again. We've made the roses peeping out, the babies are at the door. We cannot make ourselves, you know, cause we've been made before. Peter, seeing this to be a good idea, at once pretended that it was his own. The house was quite beautiful, and no doubt Wendy was very cozy within, though of course they could no longer see her. Peter strode up and down, ordering finishing touches. Nothing escaped his eagle eyes. Just when it seemed absolutely finished, there's no knocker on the door, he said. They were very ashamed, but Toodles gave the sole of his shoe, and it made an excellent knocker. Absolutely finished now, they thought. Not a bit of it. There's no chimney, Peter said. We must have a chimney. It certainly does need a chimney, said John importantly. This gave Peter an idea. He snatched the hat off John's head, knocked out the bottom, and put the hat on the roof. The little house was so pleased to have such a capital chimney that, as if to say thank you, Smoke immediately began to come out of the hat. Now, really and truly, it was finished. Nothing remained to do but to knock. All look your best, Peter warned them. First impressions are awfully important. He was glad no one asked him what first impressions are. They were all too busy looking their best. He knocked politely and now the wood was as still as the children. Not a sound to be heard except from Tinkerbell, 
who was watching from a branch and openly sneering. What the boys were wondering was, would anyone answer the knock? If a lady, what would she be like? The door opened, and a lady came out. It was Wendy. They all whipped off their hats. She looked properly surprised, and this was just how they had hoped she would look. "'Where am I?' she said. Of course, Slightly was the first to get his word in. "'Wendy, lady,' he said rapidly, "'for you we built this house.' "'Oh, say you're pleased,' cried Nibs. "'Lovely, darling house,' Wendy said, and they were the very words they had hoped she would say. "'And we are your children,' cried the twins. They all went on their knees, and holding out their arms, cried, "'Oh, Wendy lady, be our mother!' "'Ought I?' Wendy said, all shining. "'Of course it's frightfully fascinating, but you see I am only a little girl. I have no real experience.' "'That doesn't matter,' said Peter, as if he were the only person present who knew all about it, though he was really the one who knew least. What we need is just a nice motherly person. Oh, dear, Wendy cried. You see, I feel that is exactly what I am. It is, it is, they all cried. We saw it at once. Very well, she said. I will do my best. Come inside at once, you naughty children. I am sure your feet are damp. And before I put you to bed I have just time to finish the story of Cinderella. In they went. I don't know how there was room for them, but you can squeeze very tight in the Neverland. And that was the first of the many joyous evenings they had with Wendy. By and by she tucked them up in the great bed in the home under the trees, but she herself slept that night in the little house, and Peter kept watch outside with drawn sword, for the pirates could be heard carousing far away, and the wolves were on prowl. The little house looked so cozy and safe in the darkness, with a bright light showing through its blinds, and the chimney smoking beautifully, and Peter standing on guard. After a time he fell asleep, and some unsteady fairies had to climb over him on their way home from an orgy. Any of the other boys obstructing the fairy path at night they would have mischiefed, but they just tweaked Peter's nose and passed on. End of chapter 6